I saw a movie so you didn't have to. And for this one, you don't want to. In fact, I don't know of anybody who would want to see this film, whether they paid for it, see it on streaming, had somebody give it to them. It's not very good. And we'll go into the reasons why, but I saw the American Society of Magical Negroes, and it is, well, everything you would expect it to be. So let's move on and talk about it, because there's a lot to talk about here. First off, I just want to say thanks for checking out my website, beachpunk.us. It's where you can get all the amazing merchandise from the hats to the shirts to the water bottles to the coffee mugs to sandals to beach shorts to beach towels to you name it. There's even shoes. And I just want to say thanks in advance for supporting the channel right there. And if you are a regular viewer of my content and have not yet subscribed like about 60% of you right now, please hit that little red subscribe button and turn it to gray. On that note, let's get right into it. And of course, here's the thumbnail. I even have my name on there. So I saw this movie, so you didn't have to. And right from the very beginning, you get a lot of mixed signals. You get an idea that you're investing in something that's going to be magical, it's going to be funny, there might be some romance, there's all these things that you're kind of being told are going to be there, at least according to the trailer and the teaser trailer and a lot of the material that came out in advance of this. Well, I'll just say this, uh, none of that seems to be true. Um, and we'll, 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 we'll discuss why, but here we are uh, with Justice Smith. This is Justice Smith. He is the star of the film, the protagonist, so to speak. And he has a interesting journey, which we'll go through. And I'm going to have a few minor spoilers as we go through this, just as a warning there. But this is, this is our hero, hero. His name is Aaron. Now, he's very timid around people. Well, specifically, I guess, white people, which we don't find out immediately. We just kind of think he's a bit of a wallflower, and he's an artist. He does yarn sculptures. And he's not very successful at it, and he can't sell it. And then he has an encounter with a barman at an art show, and he leaves the art show unsuccessful, throws his yarn sculpture in the trash, and uh, makes his way down the street seemingly towards home. At least that's what we're taking from all of this. And in a scene that drags on too long, we find that the barman is actually following him. Well, he is uh, going to an ATM where, and, and Justice here, Aaron, arrives at the ATM, finds he has $17 as his bank account, doesn't take out any money, and steps away. Then a drunk woman shows up, and exactly what you think would happen happens. She asks for his help. He ends up somehow holding her purse, and she starts yelling that she can't find her ATM card, which is in the ATM machine, and two drunk white guys show up. Immediately, there's a problem. So right before the situation escalates, something happens in the blink of an eye, and everything goes back to a way that kind of de-escalates the situation. Well, of course, you guessed it. The barman, uh, played by a pretty good actor, to be fair, uh, is essentially one of these magical people. He immediately, immediately, with no further investigation into Aaron at all, invests in Aaron and says, hey, I'm going to take you somewhere and kind of takes him to a job interview because there is a recruitment class that's coming up where he can join a secret society, the American Society for Magical Negroes. And it has all of the Harry Potter-esque elements in there, including some magical cues, uh, which you will, you'll know there's magic happening because there'll be an audio cue because I wanted to make sure you didn't miss that. But uh, he ends up in this class. He's being taught from the very beginning how essentially white people are the cause of the world's problems. And they're, well, they're dangerous. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But they take on white people who have a tear meter that when it gets into the red, it means they're, they're dangerous. Something bad's going to happen. So they, as part of the jobs that they assume, go around and solve these problems and help them get past their issues so that 
they don't explode and do something crazy when they're around black people. And you think I'm kidding. I'm not. And um, remember I said this was supposed to be a comedy? Well, you don't really get there but three times. And they are so non-impressive. They don't, they're, they, they don't leave an indelible mark that I would remember that I can't even tell you the two that I kind of chuckled at, but I can tell you about the one, and it's a little rough. Anyway, as we go through and we're being, we're, we're seeing the training, uh, being exposed to what they go through, we also find that what she's about to do is a pen sieve of sorts, which allows them to see into the past and observe lessons by people who were essentially de-escalating situations. And... They use not necessarily directly the Green Mile, but they use the Green Mile as a starting point. They also use, and this is another uh, a point of uh, a learning experience, they also use the Legend of Bagger Vance, except that in this case, it's a, uh, for a, a billiard champion rather than a champion golfer. And as we progress and we learn about what it is that their job is they take on these clients, the people that need the help. Uh, we also get to see the real thoughts about, well, white people, the most dangerous creatures on the planet. Of course, not the shark that's pictured here. And again, you may have seen this during the trailer. But as I watched this, I realized this was intentionally... Inflammatory. That's the word. Intentionally inflammatory. Uh, David Allen Greer is a talented ac a actor, right? And he plays the character very well. The problem is, is it just is soul crushing to hear that they're throwing so much shade on one race. Now, I know I'm white presenting. So perhaps you would think that I was offended for that reason. And I'm like, no, because you replace this with any other race, you're going to be offended. Just swap the name, the names and the places out and you're going to be that way. Anyway, we'll continue on because we're still looking for humor and we still have some magical devices. Sorry, I wanted to throw that in there. The magical pocket watch that he was given when he got his first client it's kind of rings like a cell phone. Anyway, moving on. Sorry about that. This is the first client. This is Aaron's first client. His name is Jason, I think. That's how little of an impression that made on me. But I think it's Jason. He is really stressed out at work because he's trying to climb the corporate ladder. He doesn't feel like he's being successful in his design. I guess he's a graphic designer or, or a, a, an application designer for this fictional company called Meatbox. And... Aaron is there to try to bring his stress level down so he doesn't go after anybody. Interesting, right? Um, and the weird stretch of this premise is that the real purpose of the society of magical uh, uh, Negroes, the real American society for magical Negroes, is there to um, make white people feel comfortable. They kind of explain uh, the situation that's happening around them in a way that it isn't terribly condescending and will help encourage growth and obviously achieve success uh, for their client. And that's what he's set up to do, make Jason a successful person. The problem is that there enters into the situation not just the main goal, which is to get him successful in his job, but to land this girl and i don't remember her name at all again not super impressive uh but she's a very talented actress i don't know her name uh for 105 minutes uh for the time that she's involved it, it, there's a little bit of a, a a moment or moments of bearableness where you actually will appreciate what's happening regardless if this sounds like it's long it is because the pacing of the film is terrible and because this woman enters and becomes a romantic interest for both the client and for Aaron, we have an additional barrier. 
which leads to some problems because if any of these wonderful uh, magical people uh, betrays their duty, which is to serve the client, then everybody's magic disappears. So, of course, you know what's going to happen. The magic, of course, disappears because he is interested in her. So we get to the end of the film and we discover that, well, because nobody can perform magic, uh, what would normally happen to our friend Aaron here is would, would be that he would lose his memory. And he doesn't uh, because there's not enough magic to make that happen. So ultimately, it's a rom-com, but it's not. The only time it's funny is, and let me rewind here in my little areas here. The only time it's funny is when it references the Green Mile and one man is trying to cure another man's uh, ability to rise to the occasion with a lady. Become tumescent with excitement. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And that's where I laughed out loud because that was actually amusing because it looked very uncomfortable for both men. Anyway, moving on. The biggest problem here is even with all of that wrapped up nicely in a, a prepackaged bundle that you can consume easily, it's, it's not engaging. This is a very boring film. There's, again, no humor, no romance, uh, and uh, not a whole lot of story. In fact, it devolves into what a lot of uh, uh, politically involved films have been doing lately. Um, sitting in at tables, talking about our feelings, sitting on benches, like in this scene, uh, talking about our feelings, uh, and, and a whole lot of other things. And the pace of which most of these things happen is very plodding and slow. This should have been less than 90 minutes as a film and ended up stretched to 105. So, it's not funny. It comes off quite racist and very distant to any audience that's going to try to watch it. It's not believable that this character, Aaron, would exist in the real world. But that's the entire point of the film. Because during a lengthy diatribe towards the end, he expresses just how much... He deserves to exist in the world to Jason, his friend, and just how much they weren't friends and all of these other things. It's very strange and could have been done much better. The story could have been told much better if he, you started with the dry tribe and then rewound and kind of spun the tale from there. But hey, I didn't direct the film. It's not going to do very well, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And we'll get to my score in just a moment. But what do you think other people are scoring the film? Well, let's measure. Let's measure the scores for the American Society of Magical Negroes. Well, we can use several different ways to score something. We can score it with, well, reviews from other people and find out that they think that it's a bloodless satire. I don't know that there was a satire at all in this, as I said before. I don't think there's any satire here, as you Get back up to the title. Not sure why I did that. Sorry about it. But um, it's not too eager to please. It doesn't please anybody. And the tropes that it's trying to fight against, obviously, like the magical black person, um, it doesn't. It doesn't even effectively deal with that. There's no satire to be found. But since reviewers aren't enjoying this film, and we'll get to more of that in a moment you can see that maybe the company that released it, Focus Features, is kind of worried because they're not letting any financial information hit the market. We're already past preview day where we would pretty, uh, pretty much have a good inkling of what a film's performance would be financially. Right now, we got no numbers, despite the fact that we have numbers for Arthur the King, which is the Mark Wahlberg and the Dog film that uh, that's coming out at the same time, which only made about $825,000 in the box office. Now, its competition, of course, is the Kung Fu Panda 4, which is going to win the weekend again, a little over $30 million plus, I would say. But it, at least we have those numbers as well. So why don't we have these numbers yet? It's not because it's released in limited theaters, because it's over 1,000 considered to be a wide release. And we don't know. What we do know is that, well, 
as we scroll through uh, Box Office Pros page real quickly, we'll find their chart, which tells you what they think films are going to make. There's conspicuously a film missing from here. Then I went back a few days and found that it's missing there as well. You have Ghostbusters already. That doesn't come out until the 22nd. You have Luca, which is a terrible re-release coming from Disney Pixar. You have Asphalt City. That's on the chart. You have God, Godzilla X Kong, the new empire there with its projection. Uh, the Land of Saints and Sinners. You have the first Omen, which has a prediction here. You have Monkey Man, which actually looks pretty good. Can't wait to see that one. Uh, and you have, let's see, Suga. I don't know what this is, but you have that. And you have Civil War which is coming out from A24. You have Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead and The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which is a film I will definitely see and review. But there's nothing else there. Why? Well, I'll tell you, the film's only projected in the United States to make about $3 million in its opening weekend. And you did hear, hear me right. About $3 million. All right, well... But there's got to be another place that we can figure out what the general audience thinks about the movie, right? Well, there is one that we look at fairly regularly. This is Rotten Tomatoes. And as you can see, this particular film isn't pleasing anybody. There's a 29% on 41 reviews from the critics, and there are fewer than 50 verified ratings currently for the audience score. What does that tell me? It tells me that A, they're not going to have a lot of people see this film, and B, 62% is artificially high because only the people that really wanted to see this film, other than myself and maybe a few other reviewers, are really the only people going to see this film. So the scores will be a bit skewed. We'll take a look at them here and all the verified ratings and reviews that come in. And, uh, well, two. Two. Both giving very high reviews. Truly. Looking at top critics, well, not a lot of love there. That's a lot of green. And I, this was incredibly honest here by uh, Rhonda Rocca Penrus. Uh, unlike American fiction, Magical ne Negroes lacks broad appeal. That doesn't make it a film without merit, but it makes it hard to sell to a more mainstream black audience. And I have some anecdotes to go along with that. But of course, you're not here for that. You're here for my final thoughts, which is this. This is not a good movie. And for a lot of people, it will be offensive. It has a lot of divisive elements in it, and it didn't handle the subject matter very well. This could have been done brilliantly and beautifully well, much like Blazing Saddles handled a whole lot of other things going back all those years ago. If I were to score this film last night, I would have put it at about a 5 out of 10. I might have bumped it to a 6 if I'd laughed more. But after sleeping on the film, as I have now, as the time that we're recording this is Friday, I have to reduce the score yet again to about a four, and that still may be too high. There wasn't a lot of redeeming value to the movie. There were some good ideas, and perhaps a structural change and some significant cutting down would have improved things. And maybe had they not jumped around so much trying to explain away these magic powers, we wouldn't have uh, gotten so lost at the beginning. Then you could have added some fun elements in there as well. Although I think the reference to Monticello is going to bother some other people for some reasons. But if I'm going to put this on my five star scale, this has a two. This is a two out of five. And it may even slide down to a one and a half. And that's a disappointment. Whenever I score a film as a three star, that would might be something worth seeing on streaming. If it's lower than three, decent chance it's not.
pacing, structure, story, acting, humorless. I unfortunately can name more problems with this film, but it wouldn't be fair because I don't think many, if any, of you are going to go see it. On that note, I saw a movie, so you didn't have to. Now, to show thanks, please hit the thumbs up button down below and leave me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are on this film, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down there as well. And of course, if you liked this video, share it around on your social media and encourage other people to take a look at all the other materials surrounding this film to gain a greater understanding for, well, all the other reasons you probably shouldn't see it. On that note, be sure to take care of yourself, take care of others, and until next time, see ya.